Well, good good morning. It's good to see your safe faces this morning. Hallelujah. Worship. We worship Him. God, we worship you this morning. And we're just going to keep on worshiping God. We just just keep on worshiping God with me. You know, uh, while we get this word into us this morning, may it be uh, a word that settles into the worship that we've already had this morning. May, may this, this word just kind of get inside of us and join with the worship spirit inside of us and make something of today. Amen? Amen. Make something today that wasn't yesterday and isn't tomorrow. Do something amazing in your people today, God. We just, we pray that over this word and over each other this morning. Uh, many of you know we're in a series called What Are We Waiting For? And man, I just, you know, I don't know if you, when you hear things like this, like a series, does it get into you uh, where, you know, you just start to watch something on television or on social media or you're talking to someone or a discussion you have at work or at home, around the table, wherever it may be, and that this this thing just gets in into you when the Word of God just starts to plant seeds inside your life. And then you begin to say, well, wait, what am I waiting for? You know, in so many situations, and just lately, I find myself saying, just well, what am I waiting for? Like, what am I holding back? Like, through all this mess that in this time that has separated families and loved ones, uh, this, this mess, this COVID thing, uh, through a time where the entire world is sick. Like, think about that. Right now, like... Our attitude as a people in the whole world is that the whole world is sick right now. And, but when we but when we understand as Christians, we come together, we sing a song even that says that says when he walks into the room, sickness starts to vanish. Do you know that when Jesus comes on the scene, I'm preaching like we're out the bat today. When Jesus comes on the scene, uh, sickness begins to vanish. You know, there are people right now that, that we're saying, what are you waiting for, Christian? I mean, we're talking to each other in this series. What are we waiting for as Christians? This world needs us. This world needs Jesus. And so as Christians, what are we waiting for? But then the world, it seems like they're, they're holding their breath. It seems, it seems like they're waiting to exhale. I know there's a movie like that. And actually, the title of this, this message today, you're going to see, kind of makes sense with that. And the title of this message today is, you know, we'll understand as we go, is are we waiting to exhale or are we waiting to exile? Because I want to read to you a very familiar story today. But well, we're going to start out in the book of Leviticus, because you know that's an interesting book. The book of Leviticus. Everybody loves that book. My favorite scripture. Leviticus. Um, we'll go over the meaning of this book in a moment. But I want you to turn with me. We're going to dive right in here. Leviticus chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, turn to Leviticus chapter 13. Now, if you have the King James, this will be, this will be a difficult read for you. Uh, so you may want to tune it up a little bit to the New King James Version. Uh, and, but I'm actually going to read from the NIV. It's a, just a, a, a read that won't make me to stumble too much. So bear with me. In Leviticus chapter 13, let's start in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when anyone has a swelling or a rash or a shiny spot on their skin that may be a defiling skin disease, they must be brought to Aaron, the priest, pay attention to that, the priest, or to one of his sons who, are, who is a priest. The priest is to examine the sore on the skin, and if the hair in the sore has turned white and the sore appears to more to be more than the skin the skin deep, it is a defiling skin disease. When the priest examines that person, he shall pronounce them ceremonially unclean. And if the shiny spot on the skin is white but does not appear to move, be more than skin deep, and the hair in it has not turned white, the priest is to isolate the affected person for seven days. 
On the seventh day, the priest is to examine them, and if he sees that the sore is unchanged and has not spread on the skin, he is to isolate them for another seven days. For a total of, by the way, two weeks isolation. On the seventh day, the priest is to examine them again, and if the sore has faded and has not spread in the skin, the priest shall pronounce them clean. This is important. The priest shall pronounce them clean. It is only a rash. They must wash their clothes and they will be clean. But if the rash does spread in their skin after they have shown themselves to the priest to be pronounced clean, they must appear before the priest again. The priest is to examine that person. And if the rash has spread to the, in the skin, he shall pronounce them unclean. It is a defiling skin disease. When anyone has a fi defiling skin disease, they must be brought to the priest. Now this is, a, this is all listed in Leviticus chapter 13 under the category of regulations about defiling skin disease. You understand? Let's jump down to uh, chapter 13 verse 45. Jump down to verse 45. And anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes... Let their hair be unkept, cover the lower part of their face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. Hallelujah. Father, we pray today that your word would be alive in us. That God, we would hear from you today, not from a list of legalities, not from a list of to-dos, not from a list of precautions, but from your list that gives eternal life today. Let us go beyond any sickness and any disease and seek after you, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And it's in your name that we pray, amen. amen. You say amen again. Amen. Amen. With all the controversy over Thanksgiving, over the virus. Um, we, we and, and, you know, throughout this series, and throughout probably the, the last eight months or so, we probably have heard of this scripture. And what this scripture is, is it's from the priestly portion of scripture. What the duties are when something like this takes place. What are the things that we do. But you see, we live in a world today that's not much different than the world during Leviticus. You see, but today the government likes to politicize some things. So I'm going to get a little political here because, uh, because many of the things that are happening today have shifted from a safety uh, category to a political category. Category, you see, because everybody wants to claim something and they want to make it theirs and then they want to steer us in the direction that they would have us to go. But the only purpose we really see here in the book of Le Leviticus is rules that are best for everyone. Now, social distancing, you can see, is not brand new. All the way back to Leviticus, there were rules. And it seems simple. Keep those who are unclean away from the population of those who are clean. Not vice versa. Not both. Now the problem we have today is not only that it's been politicized, but it's this enemy that we can't seem to find, and therefore we don't know who the clean and the unclean supposedly today are. But I want to get to the issues here in Leviticus, like the issues that they dealt with here. Think about this. People were put out. People were put out. And by out, I mean outside. I mean not allowed to hang with you, with any other person. Like people were treated like incompetent children. We'll tell you what to do because you don't know what to do yourself. People were shamed. Unclean, unclean. 
Imagine you had to walk down the street with your mask on, shouting, unclean, I'm unclean. People were ashamed. They were isolated from their families and their loved ones. Does this sound familiar? Because it's not just Leviticus. And these are real issues. These are real issues that you, Christian, have to deal with, have to find the best way to deal with. And I'm not just talking about for you who are feeling isolated, depressed, sick, uh, worried, anxious. I'm not, I'm not just, because Christian, let's, let's, right now, let's get over that. Right now, let's say, it's not only about us getting better, it's about the world getting better. Yes. What are we waiting for? We've come up with a bunch of preventions and a bunch of precautions, but what are we waiting for? As Christians in this world, what are we to do about this whole thing? I mean, my hope is that we find some solutions in this word today. That God's going to give us, us some solutions. Not, not some precautions to take, not another list of things to do, uh, but he's going to give us some real solutions today. Watch this. Scripture does this. God's going to give us some, some real powerful, life-giving words today. You ready? Are you ready for that? Okay, turn with me to Luke chapter 17. You know where I'm going here. Turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the priests. As they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. What's so amazing about what the Lord did is that number one, the Lord did not reject them. Everyone else did. Everyone else did because they were conditioned to. See, everyone else did. They were outside of everyone else. They stood off at a distance. And I believe there's several reasons why they had to shout. Number one, so that Jesus could hear them because they were at a distance. But number two, I believe they got used to shouting. I believe there are people out there right now who, whether or not their voice is loud, they're shouting. And they need hope. And they need help. And they need healing. And what they don't understand, maybe, is that they need Jesus. Right. What are we waiting for? Christians... Don't shout back. Don't be conditioned enough to stay away from them. See, I, I want to look at a little bit different. Um, I've I preached this before. If you've been in church for a while, you've heard this before. And, you know, what happened to the nine is a big question I understand in this whole scripture. I would rather know, though, who are the nine? We're not going to get into that today. There are a lot of questions in one story. But I feel like we focus on just the one things that are very interesting to us. But I hope that we can look at the society building portion of this scripture today. The hopeful side of this story today. I mean, you know, we could stop and we could just say, this is, it could be over right now. We could finish this whole service, this whole message right now and just say, Jesus is the answer. You just read the story of what Jesus did and we walked through Leviticus and we saw all of the ways to uh, try to protect people from other people and the rules that come with 
And we saw that the priests are the ones who say whether you're clean or you're unclean. You notice he didn't go to the, um, not to bash anybody, but you notice he didn't go to the county health organization. Anyway, we can look at this story and know that Jesus is the answer. Because that's what we learned already. Or we could we could go back to the, you know, what were the nine waiting for? Or why didn't they come back? Why didn't the nine come back? Well, I got some observations for you. And I, I would like us to just, because I feel that this is what God gave my gut this week. Is, is what are the social... Uh, what are the what are the social impacts that are happening here? And we look at the context that this story takes place. Yes, there were ten. There were ten of them. Here's something interesting that I noticed this week. God said, "Look at the ten. I thought God will. You know, I've seen the ten. I read it. I know that ten came and ten were healed, and only one came back." And he said, well, what's one out of ten? So, well, that's only a tithe. Yeah, only a tenth of the people came back. I'm just going to share a personal insight with you of what God told me. God told me, Bill, you're a pastor, and you may speak to ten people. And out of those ten people, only one may respond. And you might get down on yourself. And you might think, I spoke to a hundred people and only ten responded. You might think, I spoke to a thousand people and only a hundred responded. You might think you spoke to ten thousand people but only one thousand responded. But I want to tell you, Jesus didn't stop because only one came back. I want to encourage you, Christian. Just because only one doesn't mean you stop, you slow down. As a matter of fact, pick up the pace. What are you waiting for? Go after him. Something else he showed me about this group is that they stuck together. You know that when we get exiled or when we get pushed out from somewhere, we find other people who have been pushed out from somewhere and we find ways of grouping up. You know why? Because it's in our nature to find our tribe. It's in, our, it's in our human nature to find community. And what we, what we saw here, what we see all the way back from Leviticus to this story is 10 people walked up. They were all the same. They were all grouped together and they were all separated together. It's human nature. You know why? Because it's not good for mankind to be alone. The Bible says that they were separated. They were supposed to be alone. They were supposed to be at their homes, not outside in public. But they had something in common, and they just couldn't stay home. They had to be a part of something bigger. There are people today, Christian, who are still home, still afraid, still anxious. Now, I'm not saying that they go out and throw off their mask and run carelessly and get sick. No, there's wisdom in all of this. There is still wisdom in all of this. You understand? We are sitting here today. We're illegal today. You're illegal today, by the way. Uh, but you are separated by all of the, of the means that we have taken wisdom from the doctors and from all who, who think they know best. And we have, still in, we have still taken those precautions, yet we can speak life into every situation. I want to tell you something. I want to show you something because it's not just about healing a sickness. You see, all these men had one thing in common uh, that separated them from society and made them outcasts, and it's called leprosy. And by its very definition, it's a bacterial skin disease, Hansen's disease, some refer to. But here's something interesting I found in the definitions of leprosy. 
Of all the definitions of leprosy, it seems to list the second thing that has really risen in probably the last 30 or 40 years, I would say, among people. You see, the second definition is this, a shunned person for moral or social reasons. You see, it's not only become a sickness and a sick person, it's become now that we speak of it as if you had leprosy. You can bet that people are going to speak of COVID the same way. As if you had COVID. It'll immediately be attached, just like leprosy, to separation, to outcast, to social distance. I've always hated that term. They stood at a, at a distance for a reason. You see, they weren't being courteous to others. They were being quarantined. They weren't being, uh, you know, put out so much as they were uh, being put away. And what were they waiting for? Here's something else the Lord showed me. If the one was a Samaritan, and he pointed that out, so there's a purpose behind that. The one is a Samaritan. In other words, he's the one, he's the stranger from a foreign land. He's the one that we don't really hang out with. He's the one we don't really like, let's face it. As a people, we don't like them Samaritans. It's like Raiders fans. You know what I mean? I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We made a bunch of enemies there. <laughs> um, you, you know, there, it's this, it was this stigma and Jesus points it out that the one who came back, is he disappointed? Yeah, I believe so. The one who came back to Samaria. And I want to know, who are the nine? Let's just, let's just pretend we know for a minute. Let's pretend we know that the nine are actually from a familiar place who know Jesus. The one is the foreigner. He's the stranger. But the nine, they actually know better. Now, let's kind of take that a step further and pretend that the nine are the church. Let's pretend that the nine are Christians. You know, when they ask you the question for the poll, are you a Christian? And you say yes because you don't know what else to say. Or you say yes because you think you are. Man, I'm just going to hurt some people. I mean, I already made some enemies. I'm just going to make some more in the church. Now, <laughs> now see, maybe... Uh, and here's a list of reasons. Now, I don't know. This is just reasons. And I don't even know, honestly, who come up with these reasons. But I read them somewhere, and I picked them. And I thought, these are good reasons. So don't think that I come up with this, because I'm not that smart. But, but here's, I just think, kind of imagine, what if nine people who didn't come back, why didn't they come back? Well, one man waited to see if the cure was for real. One man waited to see if it would last. Maybe one man said that he would come back to Jesus later on when he had more time. Uh, maybe one decided that they really, now they get this because this, this sinks in a little bit. Maybe one decided that they really never did have leprosy to begin with. Maybe Jesus didn't really heal me. One would say, you know, over time I probably would have got better anyway. One would say, you know, with medicine, the, the doctor would have made it better anyway. Jesus didn't really, you know, do anything. Or one would have said, you know, I was already starting to improve anyway. So maybe it was a matter of me getting up and doing You understand that in this world today, there's plenty of the nines. There's plenty of those who would say that it's because of this, it's because of that. And I would, you know, do you know there are plenty of people uh, who today, like these people, are afraid to say that they have had, been around, or even have COVID. Why? For fear of being shamed, put out. Thanksgiving, one of the most important days of the year. I love Thanksgiving. Uh, what I love about Thanksgiving is not just the food. Uh, what I love is that, do you know, you know, maybe this is some of your households growing up. We didn't have the super Christian household. We didn't pray over every meal. We didn't do everything right all the time. We didn't go to church all the time. We were a little bit more C&E's, Christian and Easter, or Christmas and Easter. 
But something was always special about Thanksgiving. Even if we never prayed, we prayed around the table as a family at Thanksgiving. It's what I love the most about Thanksgiving. We didn't change anything for Thanksgiving this Thanksgiving, just so you know. And so I'm going to keep my distance from you, and we're all going to keep our hands clean, and we're all going to be responsible adults. We're not going to let the government treat us like children. Something special happens at Thanksgiving. I love seeing my nieces and nephews and great nieces and great nephews, my in-laws, my, my family. Um, we all go to the same place. That didn't change, just so you know. It didn't change this Thanksgiving. It's a special, uh, it's a special time. But here's the thing. It's a time, i got to read this before I get off track here. It's a time uh, when we are not only thankful uh, to God uh, for His grace over us, but it's the time that we decide we're going to, no matter what else is happening, all the kids, shut up. <laughs> all you got, let's all get in the same room. And today is Thanksgiving. Now, I don't care what they've taught in schools lately. Today is Thanksgiving. We are thankful to God. For this land that we get to live in, right, our right. freedoms that we endure, that we that we get to walk through every single right, day, yeah. we're thankful to God, and so this is the time. This year, though, it's different. This year, we did so with a shadow over us. See, this year uh, we did it with a little bit of fear and a little bit of shame. Because people would say, how irresponsible of you. How, you know how many times I've already been told how irresponsible for us to have church? Granted, it's from people who don't understand the essentialness of the church. So I take it with a grain of salt, as they say. Many states have issued a, a stay-at-home order. In, in Oregon, Governor Brown uh, is encouraging people to call the police on neighbors who meet with family over Thanksgiving. It's the world that we live in today. What happens when you exile people? What happens when you separate them, put them against each other? What happens when you politically separate them? What happens when you racially separate them? What happens when you socially separate them? Then these groups begin to gather, and your unity that you want actually caused division. That's what happens. And so I'm not looking for fixes from Leviticus. I'm looking for cures to this social disease that we have today. Because it's not just a virus. Uh, one other note that I had in bold here is this important point in context to this story to realize that not only did the ten lepers need healing, but I believe that the society around them needed healing every bit as much. You see, this social disease that's happening, you see, every, there's a social uh, group that needs healing, not just the ones who have COVID. Jesus' healing was to glorify God and to teach us of the healing power that is available in us through us, because we believe in Jesus who saved us, and the Holy Spirit has risen up inside of us, and taken, he resides inside of us. And so there's another lesson here that Jesus is trying to teach you, me, the Christian, that we need healing. We need healing. We won't see healing by exiling people in need. We won't see healing by separating ourselves from the sick or the weary or the exiled. We won't see healing by playing the telephone game with social media. We won't see healing uh, through the media drama that's out there that focuses on dividing us and lying to us. We won't see healing through looting, arson, anarchy, or violence. We won't see healing by separating people. We will see healing when we stop putting people out and start having difficult conversations with sick people. Yes. Amen. 
Yeah, because see, then the truth of Jesus can be shared. That Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the Holy One. He's the Anointed One. He's the Savior. He is our healer. He's the only name by which mankind can be saved. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the Wonderful Counselor. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's Jesus. We need life. We need Jesus. Hallelujah. Luke 17, 11 through 13, it says this. We're going to reread it. As Jesus went to Jerusalem, he passed between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood at a distance. And they lifted up their voices, saying, because I don't think I said it loud enough the first time, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And so here's where the, the question of the whole series comes in. What are we waiting for? I, I believe the world is waiting to exhale, and some of us are waiting to exile people instead. What are we waiting for? You know, I, I thought reading through this, when I first read Leviticus, I thought, well, this isn't the world that we live in today. I, many times, the first time Christian that you go to the Old Testament, it's the first thing you think. Well, it's the Old Testament. As if as if somehow the Old Testament is irrelevant to today. It's not. No. I mean, we've seen the mirror <laughs> that is in Leviticus. You see, we don't live in, in much of a different time today than they did then. The Samaritan in this story was called a stranger in this land. You know, we don't always call people strangers, but by our actions and by our posts and by our language, sometimes we make them feel like strangers. It's hard to invite a stranger to your home. And so you first have to uh, earn the right to be heard. You know, you, you first have to say, I, I'm I'm Bill. <laughs> That's who I am. And it's nice to meet you. You're not a stranger now. Are we giving people a breath of fresh air? This is what they need. Jesus' healing was to glorify God and to teach us, Christian. In the scripture, there's a lesson in grace in verse 14. Jesus didn't go along with the program. See, we have been conditioned that this is what we do. You understand that eight months later into this sickness, we're conditioned. You, you, you already hear the language that's, that's coming out. The language is new normal. Can I tell you? This is not normal. It'll never be normal, new or old. But you see, we're, we're, we're conditioning ourselves, preparing ourselves. Think of how many years. You see, this is what people did. It was just that what people did. It was the rule of the land. You see, when those people are that, we separate them, and it's how we treat them. You see, it's a condition that we've been uh, taught. And so Jesus comes, excuse me, Jesus comes along the scene, and he and, he, and he, you know, I'm, I'm just picturing that there's a lot of people there. It doesn't say how many people are there, but there are 10 that we know of that were off in the distance. And they shout, and Jesus breaks the rules. I mean, he doesn't totally break the rules where he doesn't run over to them and lay hands on them like other places. But in this situation, stops everybody and he pays attention to them. See, when everybody's conditioned to ignore them or put them out or, you know, separate themselves from them, Jesus didn't go along with the program and ignore them. Jesus took notice of them. We need people to understand that Jesus takes notice of you. You see, I see you, I recognize you, and I know someone 
who not only can heal you, but I want to, I got to get to this other part quick because I'm getting excited about it and then I'll get ahead of myself. Uh, he responded to their plea. Jesus immediately responded to their plea, their cry, their raised voices, their shouts. Jesus immediately. Luke 17, verse 14. When he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. Now, we've already read Leviticus, so we understand why he's saying to them, to the priests, right? One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Hallelujah. And he was a Samaritan. You see, the other ones were too busy saying, yeah, I probably would have got healed anyway. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But Jesus asked, we're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other one? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to them, this is really important for us today. I don't want us to leave us today, uh, here today, without realizing this part. He said to them, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now hold on a second. I got a problem with this. He was already healed. That's why he came back. Right? Why didn't he stand up and say, well, Jesus, uh, I already, uh, I mean, thanks anyway. But I was already well. So I came back and said, thank you. I want to show you something. Just go with me. Have some spiritual imagination with me. You ready? And they're, they're hitting like. Uh, but what are we waiting for? It's not enough. What are we waiting for? Stay with me. Stay with me. See, many of those who are outside the church, uh, but who have faith in Christ. You see, by the way, there are people outside these walls who actually have faith in Christ. Yeah, you, we're not the only church. And the churches out there that think they're the only church that have people who are, you know, they're fooling themselves. Look, there are people walking around out there without a church body, without a group to whom belong, without a tribe to identify with, who believe in Christ but are not real sure about your church. You see, some churches uh, have put uh, special programs you know, to be to be sensitive about things, to be sensitive about other people's feelings, to be sensitive about, uh, you know, I mean, I could get really super political right now. Uh, the churches have become, have tried to mold themselves with the world and get the world to understand what racial problems we have, what hating problems we have, what sickness problems we have. And in doing so, they merge with this, with this, with this, uh, it becomes ordinary, it becomes uh, something that uh, the church now uh, partially has been conditioned the same way the world was conditioned. The church, we have to continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Now listen, we can sanitize our hands and still be the hands of Jesus. Uh, we, can, we can wear some safety uh, solutions and still minister to those in need. You see, Jesus 
spoke to them. It's all he needed. It's, it's really what we need to begin with, to speak to them. We have to continue bringing peace. We have to continue preaching hope to people who need hope. It's wisdom to wash our hands and to stay safe. But wisdom also says never in this time, in this world, I'm going to say it again, wisdom also says never in this time, in this world, are we to stop being a spirit Phil believer. Now, notice I didn't say church. I'm just saying you, me. We need, there's never a time that we are to stop being a spirit filled believer. Nobody can ordain that. Nobody can make laws about that. Jesus said in John 6 37, He said, All whom the Father gives me will come to me. And he who comes to me, I will never. Cast out, Jesus said. You see, listen, let's get back to this real quick because I can't end without showing you this. It's not only the leper. It's the lonely. It's the broken. It's the hopeless. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. No true solution had arrived in Leviticus. Listen, only precautions. That's all the world and the government is offering today is precautions. It's wisdom. It's science. I get it. We'll tell you what to do, who to touch, and who will get the vaccine. <laughs> but Leviticus is a book listing the duties of the Levite priests. That's what Leviticus was for. It's where we started. This book lists ways of doing things, rules of how to work, and what we've got to work with. But Luke a little bit different. You see, Leviticus, the meaning is of the Levite priest's teaching. It's an order of how the Levite priests are to do things. That's what it is. The book of Luke is a little bit different. The definition of Luke means this. The name Luke is the English form of the Latin name Lucas, but is derived from the Latin name Lucius. It either means the great Lucius or it's a shortened firm form of the Latin name, which means the bright one or the one born at dawn. You see, in this Old Testament book, we have some rules and regulations about how to manage things. And it makes sense. And I like that. I'm okay with that. And those rules and those things, they carried on to the New Testament. But here we have a New Testament. And in this story, Jesus comes on the scene. And all the rules are still in place. But Jesus makes a new rule. Jesus does a new thing. Jesus shines light in a new way. And he brings healing to ten men. Ten were healed. But watch this. So Jesus answered and said, We're not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Were there not any who found and returned who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Check it out, here we go again. I'm gonna put emphasis on this. Arise and go your way. Your faith, the NIV version says, has made you well. New King James Version says that too. You see, but here's the thing. They were all cleansed. But the language used when Jesus responded to this one who came back and thanked him and bowed at his feet was used other times in Scripture. And so we look to see, what did Jesus mean by this? Because Jesus, I've already been healed. It's why I came back to thank you and to bow at your feet. And then Jesus says to him, no, this is a different level of things. What I'm saying to you is that your faith that brought you back here to lay at my feet. You see, you already healed physically, but see, your faith has made you whole. You see, that's the word he begins to use. In Matthew 9, 22, it says, daughter, go. Thy faith has made you whole. The man who received sight in Mark chapter 10. Go thy way, thy faith made you whole. He didn't say it made him see. Your faith made him whole. The woman with the issue of blood in Luke 18. Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith has made you whole. Mark 5, 34. Watch this. Mark says it this way. Jesus said, same story, but Mark is the witness. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. And one more, one more. Luke chapter 18, 42 and 43. And Jesus said to him, receive thy sight. Okay, that's done. But wait, thy faith hath saved thee. 
You see, you, not only can you see, but you've been made whole because of your faith. You see, listen, church, it's not about us healing COVID. It's not just about us laying hands on people and seeing them healed. It's not just about speaking to people's hearts, giving them hope, and seeing them mentally and spiritually healed. It's not just about that. I believe that's the lesson Jesus taught me this week, is it's not just about healing a leper. It's about giving this leper eternal life, and only Jesus can do that. It's about taking this leper who was, was healed of leprosy, but was still a mess. It's about taking this blind person who still was blind, healing them to see, and then they're still a mess. But their faith had made them whole. He's taken my broken pieces, and he's made me whole. Don't get me wrong. Being healed from leprosy is a miracle. Being healed from leprosy is a miracle. Being healed of some bacteria is a miracle. These nine may have been healed at the skin level, but this one was healed at the sin level. You see, this one has been made whole. And is that you and me? And if not, what are we waiting for? Would you stand with me? We better close this before I get in more trouble. You know, you, you've heard the story. I know, uh, I think it was Matt who was mentioning it not too long ago. Uh, the, the comparison that when you're on an airplane and the, the, uh, the person pulls out the oxygen masks and shows you how to tug on the thing and put on your oxygen mask. And they tell you that you're to put yours, if you have children with you or, or someone who cannot uh, get around well, or uh, that you are to put the mask on first. Very important that you put the mask on first because you're no good to them unless you're first taken care of. You, you, you know how that goes. You, you understand that Christian today, before we can minister to anyone outside these walls or anyone outside of our place, that we we need to have ourselves in order. We need to understand that Jesus must live inside of us, and the way he does that is through his Holy Spirit. He told us that when I go, I'm going to send you a counselor. We need this, not only this eternal life, but this new creation that Jesus speaks of. And if we don't have it, we can't give it away. So would you just bow your heads with me this morning? You're going to get changed right now. I don't know what it is that you're going to change right now. God. God, today, there are many who, let's just start here, there are many who have ministered to so many people and who have prayed with and sacrificed for and given to, even given their hearts to people to see them changed there are people here, they would do anything to see somebody's life change the way theirs was. And so we've put out a lot. And God, your word taught us today that even if only one-tenth comes back, we need to rejoice and we need to fall at your feet. And we need to be encouraged to go out and do it again. Jesus didn't give up. Jesus didn't say, oh, only one out of ten came back, that's it. I'm never doing this again. Jesus didn't say that. And so, Lord, we ask today, as we are at your feet, Lord, would you make us whole? We take all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our filth, and we lay it at your feet. And we ask, God, would you, as we repent of our sins, would you forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Lord, we give you praise and we give you glory today. Lord, that next level, would, would you allow us to speak on your behalf? Like, would you, would you, co would you cover our, our prayers and our, and our words to other people? Would you send your anointing ahead of us so that we can see people changed? Lord, because it's not just about us. <laughs> it's about us changing the world. And Lord, it's a big task for us. But it's a piece of cake for you. So God, we ask for your strength, for your power, your spirit. 
God, that lives inside of us. We pray, Lord, that your word would, would go forth and that we would begin to see people changed, healed, and then made whole. And we'll be careful. We'll be very careful, Lord, to come running back and to give you all the glory and to lay at your feet and say, thank you, Jesus. Just as loud as they shout out for you, help us, Jesus, have mercy on us. May they begin to shout out, thank you, Jesus, for healing us and for making us whole. We give you all the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And amen. amen.